Okay, we are live. Um, welcome, welcome to our live social. Uh, this live social will be covering how Faunalytics makes animal advocacy more effective. I am one of your moderators, Patrick Liddy. I'm a digital marketing specialist here at Veg Fund, and I'm joined today by our communications associate, Estella Ramirez. Hello, Estella. Hi. Oh, hi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> how are you doing today, Estella? Um, pretty good. Yeah, just a um, busy morning. And so it's nice to sit down with you all and, and have, have what's going to be a really, um, I think, educational and helpful conversation. I know, I totally agree. I'm, I'm really excited as well. Um, I'm actually joining from Portland, Maine. Uh, Estella, where, where, are you, where are you located right now? Um, I'm in Los Angeles and uh, very spoiled because the weather is just mild <laughs> all through the winter. That's fantastic because it's about to be snowing here, but that's all right. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I'd like to know, or I'd love to know where everybody is, is tuning in from. So as you hop on, just like, please feel free to comment. Let us know where you're watching from. So um, today we're going to be covering, like I said, how fun it makes animal advocacy more effective. We're going to be joined by uh, Carol. I'm going to see if I can pronounce his last name right. Orszczowski. I think I nailed it. Um, he's the content director at Faunalytics. And... Um, he's an animal advocate with a passion for blending activism and art. And in addition to producing numerous short films on various animal issues, Carol is the director of Maximum Tolerated Dose, which is a full length uh, feature documentary about the psychological toll of vivisection on both animals and humans. And he's the producer of Fauna Lex Explains, the video series we'll be speaking about today. So we're really excited to have him. Um, but before we um, add them to the stream. I'm just going to talk a little bit about what we do here at Veg Fund. Uh, so here at Veg Fund, if you're not familiar, we offer grants for vegan and plant-based activism. Um, we have a few categories, community events, online campaigns, and special projects uh, that you can check out. And if you're doing um, an initiative, this something like this, like community events, film, food samplings, film screenings, um, training materials, vegan restaurant weeks, challenges. If you have something that fits one of those categories, please feel free to apply. And you can check out more about those different grants that we offer on our website at vegfund.org. We also have a variety of um, content for skills building to help you be a better activist. And actually much of them, the blog and the activist stories that we produce are actually written by Estella. And she does a fantastic job, and I would highly recommend that you go over and check those out. We also um, we have some resources available as well over on the site, so I'd definitely encourage you to check those out, especially including um, a recent activist story on Fontalytics that um, I would also encourage you to check out if you're interested in learning more. So today during the live social, I'd love it if you would ask questions or just um, if you have any comments, please feel free. Um, we'd love to field those. Um, just write them in the comments section below the video and we will get to them. And if you want to use, if you want to share anything on social, please feel free to use our Bench Fund Learn hashtag and tag us at Bench Fund on any platform. All right. So without any further ado, I'm going to add Carl to the stream. Welcome. Oh, you're muted, by the way. There you go. Hello to you both. Hi, Carl. It's really great to have you here with us. I know you've been so busy um, producing the next Faunalytics Explains video, which we'll get to talk about today. Uh, so thank you for joining us. Um, and um, yeah, in the theme of where we're all um, where we're all tuning in from, mm -hmm. I see there's people from all over the country and all over the world here. Um, I'm in LA, uh, Patrick's in Maine, Portland, Maine. Mm -hmm. um, Carl, do you wanna share where you're at? Sure, so I'm from, uh, uh, from and tuning in from uh, Peterborough, Ontario, which is a small town 
northeast of Toronto, um, kind of in between Toronto and Ottawa. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. It looks beautiful in the, in your window there. It <laughs> does. Yeah. Outside my office, uh, I can see that the leaves are falling, which means that uh, I'll probably have to get out there at some point and get the leaves off of that <laughs> uh, off of that roof. And um, yeah, it's uh, the weather's changing here. It's probably not that much different from Portland, Maine, to be honest. We had some snow the other day, and uh, you know, it's uh, it's only going to get colder mm -hmm. <laughs> for a little while. And uh, and then, you know, the spring will happen, which I'm already looking forward to. That sounds about that sounds like my life here in Portland for sure. Yeah. Um, we also have uh, Hasso checking in from Congo, which is really wow, which cool. is really fantastic. So welcome to you. Um, welcome to Beth tuning in from Houston. Oh, lovely. Beth. Beth is uh, one of our volunteer uh, writers and does some excellent work uh, doing library summaries. And we've actually chosen some of their, uh, chosen a couple of their summaries to do um, videos for. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. So hello, Beth. <laughs> hello, Beth. Well, um, thanks everyone for joining. I'm going to hop off and let's get to the conversation. Thanks, Patrick. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I, while people start to formulate maybe what questions they want to ask, and, and also I'd love to hear from people um, why they tuned in and, and whether they're familiar with Phonolytics to begin with. Sure. Um, so I bet a lot of people are, but for those who aren't, um, Carl, do you want to give us kind of a summary of what Phonolytics does? Sure. Um, so Phonolytics is an organization that exists to empower animal advocates uh, by providing them with data uh, to do their work more effectively. So we do that through um, an original research program where we um, identify and prioritize different research topics that are relevant to animal advocates and conduct original research to answer, you know, research questions that aren't being answered elsewhere. Um, we uh, maintain a research library where uh, five times a week we publish summaries of academic research um, that is relevant for animal advocates. And we also do that through uh, a range of other, those are sort of our two flagship programs. And then um, we also support advocates through a number of different uh, other resources, such as our weekly office hours, our visual resources like infographics um, and fact sheets and through the Phonolytics Explains video series. Right. So, yeah, so you're covering so many aspects of, of how research and data assists animal advocates. And mm -hmm. um, you've got your, your library of, of resources and then you're creating new resources. And you have these office hours. People might be really curious about how that works um, they might not know they can take advantage of this really great service you're providing. Um, sure. so do you want to talk a little bit about that and how people can find all these resources? They're all at phonolytics.org. Yeah, that's right. So everything is at phonolytics.org. Um, but it's a big website. <laughs> so, you know, to, to really sort of avail yourself of everything that we have there, um, you'll want to do some exploring. Um, with our office hours in particular, uh, we do those um, uh, throughout the week. Uh, the office hours are listed on phonolytics.org slash ask, A-S-K, dash, us, U-S. Um, and that's where you can find uh, the dates and times that uh, myself, the content director, and our two research scientists are available to answer questions. Um, I actually just had someone drop by uh, my office hour yesterday um, to ask me about uh, the, you know, data on per capita meat consumption in California. So mm -hmm. um, the way that office hours work, you know, there's there's different reasons to talk to myself or to yes, thank you for popping that in the in the chat. Um, there's different reasons to talk to myself as the content director or to talk to the research scientists. So if you have questions about, say, conducting your own research or designing a research project, you can connect with the research scientists. Um, if you're looking for data that already exists, um, 
or you know looking for sort of existing research on a topic um, I'm usually the person you want to talk to so um, in you know people will show up to the office hours uh, sometimes with very specific questions sometimes with really broad questions mm -hmm. and through a discussion we help to um, you know sort of hone in on what they're really looking for and then um, whether on the call or sort of in a follow-up email or a follow-up mm -hmm. call, we will provide them with what we were able to find. Um, and this is something that we provide for, uh, for free for animal advocates, um, up to three hours of pro bono support per year. Wow, that's really, really generous. Yeah. And there's lots of reasons why some, an advocate would want to um, make use of those, that, that generous offer. Um, whether it's because they are, as you said, conducting their own research or kind of evaluating their own efficacy as advocates, or maybe they just want to make sure that what they're presenting to the public is accurate, mm -hmm. um, that, 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 that they become, um, you know, a dependable source for people who are interested in, in being vegan or open to it, that, that they're providing really accurate information. So that's so important. Definitely. Um, yeah, and, and with animal issues in particular, it's, um, you know, it, it's, it's the kind of um, broad sort of category where uh, it's, it's hard to know what kind of research is out there. You know, you mm -hmm. have sort of a lot of overlaps between like biology, conservation science, sociology, um, various social sciences, and it just, uh, I think a lot of advocates don't necessarily know where to begin um, and what we can help them do is to you know really really understand whether their question has already been answered by someone else or whether this is in many cases a brand new question that no one has answered and mm -hmm. the research needs to be done on that topic um, we can help them with with both of those things and then uh, if they have the resources we can help them conduct their own research as well yeah, that's such a good point that it's it's really, really broad because animals are exploited in every aspect of society, right? So we have like, um, you know, animal agriculture, but we have also wildlife protection organizations. And then we also have, um, you know, the efforts to protect animals from scientific research, for example. It's just really, Absolutely. really broad. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and thank you, Patrick, for highlighting the, the comments today. So, uh, Diane is saying, um, I appreciate Phonolytics providing content that I can share on social media that is effective without being so graphic that my followers turn away from it. Yeah, that is something that we uh, really try to avoid. Um, not that it doesn't have a place mm -hmm. in animal advocacy more broadly. Um, but we are not an advocacy organization in the traditional sense that we are not engaged in sort of like campaign work uh, ourselves. So mm -hmm. what we do is we do our best to provide research, statistics, and data that advocates can use. And in that context, uh, it doesn't really make sense for us to be sharing really graphic images because our audience are animal advocates who, generally speaking, <laughs> already um, are engaged in these issues and and don't really need to be um, you know don't really need to see those things coming from us yeah and that's a good place to dive into actually one of the videos in the phonolytics explain series mm -hmm. where um, you talk about the context in which shocking images are effective and the context in which they're not. So do you That's want to true. talk about that study in that video? Um, sure. So one of the things, uh, so that's in the, in the Phonolytics Explained series. I'm just going to pull up that, uh, that playlist. Um, and the interesting thing about that was that it, it really do dove into, um, you know, when, not that, not that graphic images are bad to use, but when is it appropriate to use them and when is it not appropriate to use them? Um, you know, one of the findings that it highlighted was that um, when people are not prepared to see images like that, it can really backfire. So something, for example, where you are doing a public showing 
um, it can it can very much turn people off and uh, people can be um, you know people can leave a situation feeling you know sort of like psychologically assaulted by um, by seeing these things without their consent so um, you know consent is key especially in public places where there there may be children and that type of thing um, you know you want to um, you know, you just, you want to be cognizant of the context that you're using the images in. And the other finding that I thought was interesting in that video was that it highlighted that you need to give people an action that they can do. Um, generally speaking, uh, putting really graphic footage in front of people um, can be a positive tactic, but only if you give them something to do with that information. Um, it's not really it's not really fair to people to present them with really graphic imagery and then not really give them an outlet where to put the energy that they feel after that. Um, one of the things that I loved about that video was that um, we shared the, uh, as we do with, with all of our resources, we shared that video with uh, the original author of the study and they actually uh, provided us with this uh, because uh, the original study was uh, done by a Spanish-speaking person, and so uh, they actually provided us with a Spanish voiceover for that. So you can watch that video in English and in Spanish. Yeah, that's really great. And and it is, um, is it correct to say that it's your most popular video in the series? Um, that is a good question. I don't think that that one... I, it, mm, it might be the most popular in the series, but it is quickly being um, overtaken by, uh, yes, actually, it has, in the past few days, it's been overtaken by um, not the most recent video, but the, the second most recent video that we uh, released about a month ago, um, which was actually a summary of a study that was done by the meat industry itself, um, looking at mm. um, essentially this, the study was done by uh, a, a large meat industry lobby group looking at plant-based alternatives and how they might respond to the growing consumption of, of plant-based foods. Mm. And so in our video, what we did was we... And actually what uh, Beth, who is um, checking in on the chat did in the, in the summary of the, of the study was to frame the findings in a way that um, looked at what the, the beef industry would do and how advocates could respond. Mm -hmm. And so um, one of the things that uh, the grant from Veg Fund has afforded us is being able to promote some of these videos on social media, not just, you know, not just post them, but give them uh, a boost with an ad or, or that type of thing. And so uh, maybe not surprisingly, some people from the meat industry have uh, found it <laughs> and <laughs> have started to uh, share it around themselves. So uh, wow. oddly enough, we're getting a little bit of an extra boost from uh, <laughs> from their uh, from their viewership and from their comments. So uh, <laughs> to to them, I would say, you know, keep engaging. It helps uh, bring <laughs> up our stuff in the algorithm and, um, <laughs> you know, we appreciate it. I was even before you said that I was thinking I could really see how this could be an infinite loop of of seeing what what they do and trying to respond and trying yeah. to respond and and maybe maybe eventually there can be some sort of um, understanding <laughs> where <laughs> where each other is coming from and and yeah. finding finding um, what what benefits all yeah you know without hurting um, I animals. Mean, that's possible and and i think that you know we're always going to see um this sort of like strategy and counter strategy thing happening in the movement um i i thought it was really interesting a couple of years back or it may have just been last year uh, but i think it was a couple of years ago um the veganuary campaign was getting very popular and so the dairy industry mm -hmm. and, um i believe it was in the uk started this like a counter campaign called Fe Febru Dairy, yeah. <laughs> which was a, 
a bit awkwardly named, but um, mm -hmm. but the purpose of it was, you know, essentially like a counter strategy thing to like, you know, kind of promote dairy consumption through social media posts and that type of thing. So I think like, in a sense, you're right. I mean, these things are, are loops in a way. And, and I think that to some degree, you know, um, advocates, uh, you know, something that we need to be aware of is that there are certain strategies that are good to share publicly. And then there are certain strategies that we need to, um, you know, we need to be cognizant that, you know, uh, animal agriculture industries can can see our work and can uh, when we're strategizing and, and doing these things online that the that those industries can see, you know, sweet cat in the background. <laughs> Um, you know, that they can see our work and that they can respond accordingly. So we need to not, you know, we need to not just be smart about what we're doing, but smart about, you know, how we're, how we're presenting it publicly. And, and in this case, we've, you know, we, we did think about that, but I think that, you know, the, the benefits of getting the meat industry's strategy out into the open sort of outweigh the risks of them seeing what we're doing and sort of changing the playbook yeah yeah and speaking of like weighing the cost and benefit of different strategies it, mm -hmm. that's a good place to talk about in general why why data is so important um, and evaluation is so important do you want to talk a little bit about that for people who may be new to evaluating their own activities and and um you know encourage them to 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 understand how it benefits the movement and them? Sure, I mean, you know, I think animal advocacy, um, especially for newcomers, um, animal advocacy in, uh, in general is a really sort of um, emotional thing. I mean, people have, people have really strong emotions and they often get into animal advocacy because they have very strong emotions about what is happening. Mm -hmm. Um, the things that are happening to animals in so many different industries feel like an emergency and something that we need to, um, you know, sort of like run full force at immediately. And in a lot of ways, that's true. Um, but uh, as we've sort of alluded to throughout the conversation, um, not every tactic is effective at every time. Um, mm -hmm. And not every person is persuaded by the same message and mm -hmm. not everybody responds to, um, you know, animal suffering in the same way. And so uh, we need to, you know, Phonolytics was really founded um, with the presumption that, you know, we need to understand our impact and understand the effectiveness of, of different tactics and different techniques and different strategies um, in order to be as effective as possible. Um, you know, one of the things about animal advocacy compared to say like the beef industry is that we have, you know, a fraction of the financial resources that they have. Mm -hmm. And we, um, we, in many ways, uh, have a fraction of the people that they have, because when you think of how many people consume meat versus how many people don't, or how many people consume animal products in general versus those that don't, you know, it's a very, you know, we're a very small portion of the population. Mm -hmm. So we really need to maximize our resources as much as possible and make sure that we're, you know, not just working hard, but working smart. Um, there's that old expression, you know, d you know, don't work harder, work smarter. Uh, animal advocates need to work hard and smart <laughs> um, mm. because we're, you know, because we're up against a, you know, it's a, it's a really uphill battle from, from where we are right now. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That makes me think also of like, we're also contending with, let's say, compassion fatigue and absolutely. Um, so the more the more effective we can be with our hard work, you know, the, mm -hmm. the farther we'll reach. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, it's like a marathon, that's... not a race. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and, you know, compassion fatigue is a serious issue and, and that factors into effectiveness as well. You know, a, an advocate who is burnt out is 
not effective. And that's not the only reason why we should care about burnout, but mm -hmm. it's one of the reasons. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the same thing goes for, uh, you know, issues of equity in our movement. You know, people, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, the more equitable of a movement we have, the more effective we're going to be. It's not the only reason that we should be equitable. Yeah, right and that we should care about issues apart from animal issues, but it's one of the many reasons we should. Yeah, such a good point. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we've kind of been talking around the, this uh, video series, so I wanna sure. like now direct, direct ourselves to it. It's called sure. Phonolytics Explains. Yeah. Um, people can find it on the Phonolytics YouTube channel. Is that That's correct? Right. Yep, uh, and it's just, uh, you, uh, we've recently shortened our URL, so it's just youtube.com slash phonolytics. Beautiful. Um, so let's kind of back up a little and talk about why, why you all decided to create this series. What was the inspiration or thought process behind it? Sure. Yeah. Sure. So, you know, one of the things that we, you know, speaking of effectiveness, one of the things that we really take seriously as an organization is when we get feedback from advocates. And uh, one of the pieces of feedback that we get from advocates fairly often is, I love your resources. Um, I wish there were, you know, shorter resources <laughs> or uh, things that are, share, you know, more shareable. Um, not everyone is going to read a five paragraph study summary and that type of thing. Um, so, you know, we're always thinking about different ways that we can package existing resources or create new resources that will um, appeal to different advocacy groups and to different sort of um, demographics within the advocates that we already talked to. And so, uh, one of the things that we came up with, uh, I think at this point it was back in 2019, uh, late 2019, was um, doing a, an explainer series. So the idea was to take study summaries that are in our library and um, really boil down the results of those studies to like a one to three minute video. Um, we wanted to do that because, you know, five minutes feels like a, it's starting to get a little long, people tune out. Um, but, you know, one to three minutes is kind of that sweet spot where, um, you can really get the, get like an overview of something and, um, you know, you can dig into some of the findings, um, without getting, you know, too much into the nitty gritty. And so we started, um, we started that in late 2019 and we have, you know, since then we've put out, uh, I believe this is our eighth explainer, um, nine, if you count the Spanish translation of, of the one that we talked about before. And, uh, you know, we're going to continue this, this program, I think indefinitely the, the response that we've gotten from advocates has been really positive. Um, the, you know, we're, we're still quite humble in terms of views and, and how far it's been shared. Um, uh, but that's, that sort of is where, you know, where we're at as an organization as well. I think, you know, ad, advocates are aware of us. We're not the biggest organization that exists. Um, and, uh, there are a lot of advocates who still need to discover what we do and 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 how we do it, and so um, we're really we're really happy with the results of the video so far, and um, I'm really excited to to for an, another year of of putting these out. Oh, great! Yeah, I I'm glad to hear that that it's now become this indefinite project. Um, it makes a lot of sense that you know as we just talked about advocates want to work smarter, not harder. They have day jobs. And by the way, mm -hmm. thank you, Beth, who's a volunteer writer for Phonolytics. Yeah. A lot of animal advocates are volunteering their their personal time mm -hmm. and um, are contending with, with burnout. And the, maybe the last thing they can do is read a lengthy research. So you provide those summaries and now these even maybe easier to digest um, some summary videos. Mm -hmm. um, 
So that's really fantastic. And just to be clear, the videos, they're not the videos that you would share on social media to make your friends vegan. It's the videos that, that animal advocates would watch to um, digest the information that they need to be better mm -hmm. advocates. Is that correct? That's correct. And and as we talked about before, um, you know, even in our video talking about graphic images, uh, we don't use graphic images in these videos. The most you might see is uh, possibly, you know, like some meat being cooked on a grill or something like that. Um, uh, we don't use any like slaughter footage or, um, you know, animal cruelty footage to sort of make a point. Um, these are videos that are meant to, as you said, to travel from advocate to advocate, um, to discuss strategy and to, um, to refine strategy. Um, I should say that, you know, it, even though our purpose, the purpose of this project is to inform advocates, you know, we don't necessarily think that these videos are, are are a replacement for reading a whole study <laughs> or for uh, reading even a study summary. Um, you know, I think these are, are things that advocates can watch to get a quick overview and then to decide if that's a topic that they want to dive into in, in greater detail. And they do give enough data to be able to actually you know, incorporate those things in the advocacy. So if this is as much time as you can dedicate, you're still going to get something that you can use. If you can watch one of these videos and you still have more time to dedicate to the research uh, that's going to make your, your advocacy more effective, um, we have links in the video descriptions that take you to the longer study summary. And then that, of course, brings you into the Phonolytics website ecosystem and you can explore tons of different research from there. Yeah, that's a really, really good point. That they're they're not a replacement. They're they're more of a primer. Yeah, um, because it is important to, um, yeah, to be a critical thinker and reader and and to you know be curious if if you have the time and the resources to dive a little deeper and understand and make sure that um, that you do fully comprehend um, the study and and it, its context and what what it can really suggest. In yeah. your advocacy yeah 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 so working at phonolytics you've you've been exposed to all of this uh research so mm -hmm. do you do you have maybe some conclusions you've started to draw about um you know how to for example we've got a question here from somebody uh from tobin i believe Okay. Um, how can I talk to a room full of 30 construction workers about veganism? And that's very specific, Tobin. So I'm very hmm. curious <laughs> if, if, you, <laughs> if you're um, planning to talk to, to you know, uh, this group soon. Um, but, but we can extrapolate from that. You know, as I said, you know, you've, you've been exposed to all this research and, and strategy. Do you, have you started to conclude some top tips for for advocates talking to the public yeah I, I, and i mean this is a you know my my top tip is uh to understand you know advocates need to understand that advocacy is all about context it is a contextual practice that we engage in um in so many different settings with so many different kinds of people and there is Unfortunately, no one size fits all solution that is going to affect everybody the same way. So to Tobin's question about, you know, a room full of construction workers, well, um, I don't have any research in particular on construction workers, uh, you know, views on <laughs> plant-based eating, for example. Um, but, you know, off the top of my head, I would say that, um, you know, if, if you're if you're doing a presentation or let's say this is your workplace and you're, you know, maybe Tobin is talking about, you know, talking at during the lunch break or something like that. Um, it may be a situation where those 30 construction workers really don't care all that much about animal suffering. We may wish that they did. <laughs> I may, I, you know, we, we may really wish that they cared about the animal suffering aspect of it, but maybe they don't. 
And so sharing graphic images or um, talking to them about the cruelty inherent in those industries is not really going to have the effect that we think it's going to have, so or that we hope it's going to have. So in that case, it's important to um, you know try to evaluate what will be effective for that particular group of people. So in the case of a room full of construction workers, um, maybe a lot of them go to the gym and would be interested in hearing about, um, you know, the health aspects of a plant-based diet. Um, maybe some of them are actually concerned about the environment and could be uh, swayed by an environmental uh, perspective. So it's really about trying to figure out where people are at and trying to understand the profile of the group that you're speaking with so that you can um, provide them with resources that are going to be meaningful for them. Yeah, that's such a good point is, is the starting place is really understanding what your audience cares about. Absolutely. And, and I so, should, and I should say as well, you know, I don't want to necessarily profile construction workers in a particular right. way because I have, you know, I've worked at, uh, some factories in my, in my life some years back. And I remember, uh, you know, working with a couple of, of people at factories who, you know, uh, fed the feral cats that lived outside mm -hmm. and were really, you know, at least with companion animals, were very engaged in taking care of them and who uh, even, you know, were involved in companion animal rescue and that type of thing. So um, perhaps that group of people would be um, interested in hearing about, you know, comparisons between companion animals and farmed animals, for example. Um, you know, there are so many different ways that we can connect the dots for people. Um, the hard part is figuring out what dots are actually meaningful to connect. Yeah, I was going to say something similar where like understanding what your audience cares about is going to be a very unique thing. So mm -hmm. we can't say, well, construction workers care about this, but we can listen to that particular group of 30 for yep. a few minutes and asking about their lives, what they care about. And yeah, yeah. you might discover that they do... Um, love their companion animals or they care about their parents' health or they care about, um, you know, their, their livelihoods, right? How, how it might affect their, their jobs and business. And um, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, starting with listening and researching the people you're talking to is I think great advice. Yeah. Um, Wonderful. So um, is there anything else um, within the content of the videos we should explore before we talk maybe a little bit about video making in general? Sure. Um, yeah. Um, something that I think is probably important to mention too is that within the videos uh, we try to, I mean, video is already a visual medium, but sometimes, you know, you're when you're watching a video with a voiceover and this footage, you, your eyes can kind of like glaze over. So um, one of the things that I find is important in, in making these videos is to sort of keep the visuals moving along. Um, so it's not just like talking with, um, you know, with some footage of vegan food or something like that. There are, uh, you know, the key points in each video are sort of called out in visual ways. Um, when it's appropriate and when uh, the data makes sense, we will include charts and things like that to sort of show people visually what we're talking about. Um, it's it's not just a sort of a flat visual experience. There's There are some further dimensions that we try and uh, bring in whenever we can. Yeah, that, yeah, the, the videos are really well produced. And so I, I do wanna talk about that in a little bit. And I do wanna get sure. to some great questions we have here in the comments. Sure, I'd um, love questions. Yeah, so right before we do that though, um, we've talked about some of the topics in the videos. Are there any other studies you wanna talk about here that, that might pique people's interest? Um, we actually just released a, uh, we released an explainer last week um, that looks at aquaculture, which I think is a really interesting topic because, mm -hmm. um, 
you know, aquaculture, uh, for people that don't know, aquaculture is essentially fish, fish farming. Um, you sort of put fish into these large pens. They can either be on land or they can be actually out in the ocean, uh, or, you know, in lakes or, or, you know, bodies of water. Um, and, uh, you farm fish now in, in some ways, you know, fish farming makes sense. You're not depleting, uh, wild stocks and the type of thing. Um, but you know, if, if you look at the industry, um, and if you consider, uh, how few, um, animal welfare protections there are for fishes, um, it is, you know, in terms of animal welfare as it's as bad as the worst kinds of factory farming. Um, so one of the things that we looked at in this video and that the study, uh, looked at was, um, you know, is aquaculture the lesser of two evils, uh, to, to use a, a turn of phrase? Um, the reason that we called it that was because it's sort of compared to uh, the consumption of land animals as like a green alternative because it, it doesn't generate as many greenhouse gases, um, but <laughs> it does have other environmental effects. Um, so what we did was in the video, we very quickly, you know, in under three minutes, we sort of, um, looked at the, the common pro arguments for aquaculture and provided advocates with alternative, like an alternative viewpoint to respond to those, those pro aquaculture arguments. So I'm really happy with how that one turned out. It was the first one that we've done that looked specifically at, um, fishes and the consumption of fishes. Uh, most of the ones that we've looked at have been about, you know, veg eating sort of broadly speaking and haven't looked particularly at, um, at aquaculture or at the oceans or at, uh, fishes. So I'm, I'm happy that we, uh, got that one out there and we'll continue to do stuff about fishes and, and the oceans in the future. Yeah, that's, that's great. And as Faunalytics knows well, I think they've even done great infographics on this, but yeah. The, the order of met, like the, the number of lives um, mm -hmm. affected it's, as you said, as bad as animal farming, mm -hmm. um, but it's orders of magnitude larger and it's measured in pounds, not lives. So mm, it's just definitely. off the charts. <laughs> yep, How many yep. lives are hurt? Yeah. Yeah. And that was something that we explored uh, this past year. We released a, a resource called the ocean. Uh, we do a, a series called the uh, Faunalytics Fundamentals, where we sort of look in a um, kind of vertical way at uh, one particular animal topic. So, for example, we have like uh, in a, a broad animal topic. So, for example, we have a Faunalytics Fundamental about farmed animals. We have a Faunalytics Fundamental about companion animals. We have one mm. about wildlife. Um, we released one this year about ocean life in particular. Now, obviously there's um, overlap between, you know, wildlife and farmed animals and that type of thing. Um, but we wanted to sort of dedicate one fundamental in particular to ocean life because, um, you know, the issues affecting ocean life are very different from those affecting land animals, um, even when it comes to farming. Uh, one of the things that affects them, like you mentioned, is that, you know, they're, they're measured in pounds and not in <laughs> individual, mm -hmm. uh, lives. It's, it's really, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about, uh, many billions of animals, if not by some estimates, trillions, uh, per year that are consumed. And so, um, you know, it's, it is a serious issue. And that's one of the things that we mentioned in the video as well is that, you know, when you're talking about moving from land animal farming to fish farming for the sake of an environment, what you're also talking about is moving from, you know, killing, I mean, not few animals, but relatively few animals to many, many more, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. like just, as you said, orders of magnitude more. Um, so those are things that people need to consider before they, uh, promote something like aquaculture as like an alternative, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. It seems, it sounds, yeah, it gets, um, promoted in, in, in even reputable news stations, uh, mm -hmm. or outlets, um, as this kind of solution when it's not a solution at all. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. yeah. And, and currently, I mean, part of the thing that I think, you know, we, we couldn't really get into the video as, as deeply as I would have wanted to, but one of the things that, um, people say is, well, it's not really responsible for many greenhouse gas emissions. And, you know, my response to that would be, well, not yet, because it's still a, you know, relatively speaking, um, it's still a small industry compared to, um, you know, uh, chicken farming, for example. So um, mm -hmm. currently the greenhouse gas emissions for uh, aquaculture globally are, are roughly equivalent to those from sheep farming globally. Um, but if we move increasingly towards aquaculture, that mm -hmm. percentage is going to grow and, and the greenhouse gas emissions are, are from that, uh, industry are going to grow as well. Yeah. Wow. Well, I, this is a very interesting conversation <laughs> that could go on for days probably, but I want to respect everyone's time and, yeah. um, we've got some great questions and comments. Love it. Um, I want to say hi to Laura. She's in Bartlett, New Hampshire. And the comment um, covers lots of frustrations within the, the, the vegan movement um, and kind of laments that there's not more activity. Um, so, and ends by saying there are so many creative ways to engage outside animal rights and vegan realms, which is imminent. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think mentioning here that sometimes we, it's easier to sing to the, or preach to the choir, um, if you will, and, and uh, but then not get out there more. Um, and there's so many creative ways to do that. Um, Certainly. Yeah. Certainly. And I mean, I, I'm not sure uh, what the question is in there, but I, I will say, you know, it, it's, um, I know it can be, uh, you know, as someone who uh, used to be really involved in in protest organizing and and that type of um, sort of what I would call like on the street advocacy, um, you know, it can be very frustrating and demoralizing and it's very difficult. Um, but one of the things that makes it even more difficult is when you feel like no one else is doing anything about it. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, my um, my advice to Laura would be to maybe take a step back and, and try to remember rather than, rather than seeing the people who didn't show up, <laughs> you know, try to think positively about the people that did show up and try to remember that, uh, animal advocates are working on many different <laughs> issues in many different ways all the time. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Faunalytics is an example of an organization like we don't do on the street ad advocacy. Um, we don't do, um, we don't organize protests and that's, that's not the kind of advocacy that we do, but that doesn't mean that it's less legitimate or, or not um, trying to reach the same goals. So um, Laura, I hear your frustration. <laughs> I've, been there. I've been there myself, um, but try to uh, think positively about your fellow advocates and, and remember that, you know, there are a lot of us out there um, working on the issues in different ways. Yeah, that's such a, that's such a nice thought to take heart in that, that we can think about all the, yeah, the different ways we're not seeing that, mm -hmm. that vegan ad advocates are currently working all the time. Yeah. Um, so we've got some questions here. Um, Margo says, should animal protection organizations try to gather local analytics or be guided by their own feelings? Just do what you want to do. What is important to know first? Uh, I mean, of course, I'm going to say that, uh, mm -hmm. we, you know, we should, we should be guided by data because that's, you know, that is what I do and that's what Phonalytics does. Um, that being said, you know, I will say, Margo, that, uh, you know, I, I certainly spent my time and, 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 and did a lot of what I would call, you know, steam valve advocacy. Um, when I was touring with uh, my film, uh, we would do, uh, which is a film about animal experimentation, um, 
we would sometimes do like home protests and things like, you know, protesting at the homes of CEOs of uh, animal experimentation companies and, and research companies. And um, those are things that felt good at the time <laughs> and really helped, I think, to, yeah, act as a sort of like emotional steam valve for the advocates. Um, and I think in certain contexts, those things can be effective in different ways. Um, I don't think that the things that th in, in the case of the protests that I participated in, I don't necessarily think those were effective in, in achieving much. Um, it, they felt good at the time and it was a nice steam valve. It was, a, it was a nice way to, to blow off some steam because again, animal advocacy is a really emotional thing. Um, but if I'm honest with myself, those protests didn't do a whole lot. Um, and maybe those those resources of time could have been sp spent elsewhere. Yeah, that's a good point. And I think also there, the, I think where what we care to do comes into play is that kind of because that sort of guides what we're good at, what we're mm -hmm. um, talented Art. at. Yes. And so when choosing between, let's say, three effective strategies, mm -hmm. then you will be guided by what you feel like doing, right? Yeah. If you're especially good at public speaking or if you're especially good at some particular skill. Absolutely. And Estella, I'm so glad that you brought this up because something that I hear a lot from people is like they want to, they want to figure out what's effective um you know for their particular issue or something that they're passionate about but um something that they like every advocate again because this is it is such an emotional thing for us mm -hmm. um and because you know it, there are issues of burnout and that type of thing um it's important for advocates to find something that they're passionate about mm -hmm. because if you're not passionate about it um you know it's it's going to be hard to keep going when the going mm -hmm. gets tough and so um you know and going back to uh what the previous commenter said or what one of the previous commenters said um it's important for advocates to um think about effectiveness in the scope of what they are passionate about and what they're good at so for example i don't think i was ever a really great on the street protester it just like wasn't my thing it was kind of as i said before like kind of a nice steam valve from time to time but it wasn't something that i was like good at organizing or good at doing um something that i'm much better at is writing and so um being able to write study summaries uh, and write blog posts and things like that that bring together research that might help animal advocates is something that I feel uh, is in my skill set. That's the word I've been looking for for the past. <laughs> you know, advocates need to think about what their skill set is and how they can apply that to uh, a lens of effective advocacy. Um, and you need to be honest about what your skill set is. It's okay if you're not good at everything, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, figure out what you're good at, and then you can you can apply almost anything um, that you're talented at to an effective advocacy framework. Yeah, yeah, it's a kind of where the two meet is where you're going to be super like it's going to be your superpower. Yeah, you know, some advocates that I've worked with as volunteers uh, are really, you know. They're, they're great graphic designers, um, but they they don't necessarily think that they're talented in other aspects. So that's a talent that they can offer to uh, the advocacy movement more broadly that will um, that will help. I mean, all of those things help. Um, maybe you're really talented at music and you want to provide, you can provide music for free for uh, animal advocacy videos or, you know, there's just, there, there are just an infinite number of ways that people can apply their talents to, uh, to effective advocacy. That's a beautiful thought. Yeah. Um, so moving on to another question that, that Tamara has, is there any research that you know of in your libraries, um, about long-term effectiveness of 
trying to get people 100% vegan versus mm. a, a, like a reducitarian message. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is a, that's a great question. And it's probably a question that uh, Phonolytics is, uh, you know, particularly well positioned to answer because, um, you know, one of the things that actually brought our organization to people's attention back in uh, 2014 was we released a study about um, veg recidivism uh, or that that was the the term that we used uh, for it but essentially the idea that you know people who go vegan or vegetarian don't always stay vegan or vegetarian in fact within a year or two uh, we found really high percentages of people were abandoning the diet or lifestyle or however you want to frame it. Um, we're in the midst of a study right now and we'll be releasing uh, the second part of that study uh, in the next couple of weeks as a follow-up to that because um, we wanted to look more specifically at um, why people go vegetarian and vegan, um, what makes them stay that way for, you know, the long term and how we can do advocacy effectively to uh, support them through that through that journey so that we don't have such high rates of recidivism so tomorrow um keep an eye out <laughs> we're going to be releasing the second part of that report um in the next couple of weeks and i will say that if you go to i believe if you go to the phonolytics homepage right now um the if you go down if you scroll down slightly to research highlights uh the first thing on your left there is the first part of that study which is called going vegan uh, many paths to one goal and that re that first report uh there's going to be a series of three that first report looks specifically at how you know the reasons why people go veg and what we can do to support them as they transition. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. And, no problem. and by the way, I just remembered when you talked about the, the Phonolytics Fundamentals series, mm -hmm. I, I had a question pop up in my head about people might be wondering, is this also a video series, a summary page, both? Where do they find those, the, the topical-based summaries? Yeah, so if you're just looking for, um, you know, study summaries, if you go to phonolytics.org slash library, um, that's where we have our library of, um, you know, that's where we add research, uh, you know, Monday to Friday every week. Um, the fundamental series is located at phonolytics.org slash fundamentals. Um, and there you can find the six fundamentals that we've done so far. Um, and we'll be adding more. Uh, in the new year. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. So I want to start thinking about wrapping up. So, um, <laughs> okay. and, and Carl, I'm going to give you an opportunity at the end to highlight anything else we've missed. Sure. Um, and I'm going to tell our audience to please start formulating your, your final questions. If you have them, start putting them in the comments so we can answer them. Um, and then we have this comment a really nice comment a, a feedback for the phonolytic series for you carl okay. uh, this is evelyn saying that um they appreciate that the when the videos the most recent videos have had the title within the thumbnail it's because they can't always read the whole title at the bottom okay. having it in the thumbnail has been helpful wonderful um so thanks for sharing that bit of feedback great <laughs> And and Phonolytics, um, I've talked, I've gotten to talk to both you and Joe Anderson, the the lead research, the researching director, yeah. I believe. Um, and you both, I think, talked about how you love getting questions and feedback um, from your audience, and, and that helps you as well. Do you want to talk about that or any anything else you want to highlight? Sure. Um, again, you know, our office hours are a great uh, way to, um, you know, not just ask us questions, but to leave feedback if you, you know, if you find uh, something, for example, about the website that is frustrating or you're having trouble finding something, um, you can touch base with us that way and talk to us about it. Um, one of the things that I love about 
this work is talking to advocates and and really digging into issues with uh, with them because I think that that you know again not to harp on this too much but it's you know uh, animal advocacy is such a it it just inspire so much passion in people. Um, and that passion can really uh, steer us in, in many directions that um, are not actually very useful uh, for animals. And so I love to speak with people about like, about strategy, about tactics, and to look at what the data says, like, let's, <laughs> you know, one thing that we often say to uh, each other as colleagues, and, and to people who uh, you know, who come to us for advice is we say, well, let's look at the data. Like, what does the data say? Because um, when we actually have data that can inform what we do, uh, we should be using it. <laughs> we should be looking at it uh, to to guide our decisions and and to help us understand how to how to make the most of our resources. Again, like we just our resources are so limited. Um, it's really important for us to. Uh, to use them as wisely as we can. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I want to highlight one more comment, and then I think we have one more question here as we sure. get ready to wrap up. Um, but I like this comment from uh, from Laura, and it, it's it's a longer comment, so maybe we can put it on screen and, and read at our pace. But it talks about how important um, the language is, how we speak about animals and. Um, yeah, what we call things is very important. I remember speaking to Joe about how a lot of a lot there's a lot of research on what we call things and and maybe its impact. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's another one where there's a lot of back and forth between you know the traditional animal product industry versus the alternatives and, and kind of fighting about language, right? Um, do you have thoughts on that? Uh, I mean, I have thoughts and I, uh, I certainly have thoughts about it, <laughs> um, not necessarily data about it, but mm. I think it's an interesting thing that, that could use more research to, to better understand what, um, you know, what effect different language choices have. Like, for example, I believe one of the Phonolytics Explains videos uh, looked at, um, the naming of, um, plant-based food labels and, mm -hmm and um you know what's more effective and whether people were confused by uh whether you know when when a plant-based company uses a term like beef um does that confuse people into thinking it's actually real beef or something <laughs> like that um so that's not exactly addressing uh what laura's uh, asking but um you know, my personal thoughts on this are absolutely, you know, the the use of language, um, language has been used to obscure uh, the exploitation of animals for a very long time and um, likely will continue to be for a long time. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, I, you know, that I was part of uh, doing for Phonolytics uh, some years ago was developing a style guide for the website. So when we write, for example, we don't use the word pet, we use the word companion animal. And when we, um, when it makes sense, we uh, don't use the word beef, we use cow meat and things like that. Um, that being said, there are times when that type of uh, like alternative language usage can also unfortunately alienate us from the people that we want to be reaching. Um, it's important to, again, again, it's important to meet, um, meet people where they're at and to understand the kind of communication that's going to be effective for them. So for example, you know, um, you know, talking about beef and pork and seafood and game and all of these euphemisms that we have, um, that may that may unfortunately be the best terminology with which to reach people who consume those things. Um, mm. I can understand wanting to um, wanting to build alternatives into our language, and I think it's it's good to like set examples in our day to day life when we describe things, but we want to be cognizant of how uh, our language choices may have unintended consequences. It may feel good to say cow skins instead of leather, 
um, but that may uh, reinforce an image of animal advocates as sort of like separate or like you know the image of like the the weird vegan or the weird <laughs> animal or out advocate. of touch yeah like yeah. Or, you know so it's I, I would say like I absolutely agree like we do need new terms and language for this type of thing mm -hmm. um, in the meantime <laughs> we need to be cognizant of uh, how we do things um, and to not uh, set ourselves apart from, um, from, you know, the, our social surroundings too much. Yeah. Once again, context is, is so important. Um, as Laura, uh, herself brought up, um, mm -hmm. it's, uh, language is also utilized to exploit other people and Absolutely. being sensitive to that, um, when you're speaking is very important. Um, so, and, and thank you, Laura. It, um, I see your comment about being a recipient of Veg Fund grants. So thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, that's wonderful. And um, Diane says, Carl is so articulate. Great job. Yay. Thanks, Diane. <laughs> um, so one last question is about, I imagine is about local data. How do you collect right. uh, local analytics and um what kinds would be effective to collect? Uh, that's a great question. And it is, um, it really depends on what you're looking to study. So, um, and it also depends on what you mean by local. <laughs> I hate to be the person that picks apart the question, but that <laughs> is what, you know, this is, these are the things that I think about all the time. So, um, depends on what you mean by local. Do you mean local to your city? Do you mean local to your state? Uh, depending on the issue, maybe you mean local to your zip code, or maybe you mean <laughs> local to, you know, the country that you're in. It really depends on what you mean by local. So in this, in the case of, um, well, in, in every case, um, I would always recommend that advocates start by trying to explore the data that already exists. So, you know, for example, um, the question that I received yesterday about per capita meat consumption in California, um, I haven't had a ton of time to research the question yet, but something that I, data that I know already exists is per capita meat consumption in the US. So that's, a starting point from which to be able to zoom in to a more local perspective. Um, I have a feeling, again, this is a feeling and not a confirmed, you know, nothing confirmed yet, but I have a feeling that I will likely be able to dig up um, data on per capita meat consumption state by state. Um, within that, there may even be data uh, more specific to different, you know, districts in California, or maybe zip codes or things like that, that I may be able to find. So um, the first data to always collect is the data that already exists. Um, Faunalytics can help you do that. Uh, and, you know, I think most people at this point are pretty, um, you know, experienced Googlers and are, are able to, uh, you know, do research themselves. But um, it's important to look for reputable sources. You don't just want to take um, data from any old website on the internet because there is a lot of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's a lot of dangerous stuff out there. Um, so try and, depending on the issue, you want to look at the sources that you know are um, vetted or have been, you know, have some sort of like institutional support behind them. So for example, one of the things that we often look at is like the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization or the USDA or uh, the US uh, Fish and Wildlife Service and those, those types of organizations uh, collect statistics in a really systematic way. Um, mm -hmm. That's partly also why we um, summarize studies from peer-reviewed journals, because um, those studies have been conducted mm -hmm. in, a, in a really rigorous manner and then checked by other people. And it's not just someone writing a blog. <laughs> mm -hmm. Not that there's anything wrong with writing a blog, but it's not necessarily always the best, uh, the best source of data. So um, you know, think, think about the issue that you want to look at 
see what data already exists on it. And then from there, you can, uh, depending on the issue, you want to devise a research question that is going to specifically answer what you're looking for. Um, we can also help you do that as well. If you go to faunalytics.org slash research dash advice, um, we have a whole bunch of resources. I believe that's, I believe that's the URL. Um, yeah. Yes, research dash advice. Um, there are a whole bunch of resources linked from that page that will help you get started on how to do your own research project, how to gather data, um, best practices for devising a research question that is actually answerable. One of the things that we see in our office hours is people have really big questions that they want to answer. Mm. Um, we have big questions we want to answer too, but the way that you answer big questions is by breaking them down into the most narrowly focused question possible so that you can answer that question with confidence. The larger the question becomes and the more broad it is, the harder it is to answer um, with any degree of confidence because you start to get other factors that, other variables and factors that can muddy the waters and, and make the data harder to understand. So um, check out our research advice section. Uh, mm -hmm. That should be able to, to get you started on on how to how to conduct local research um, on on animal issues in your area. Yeah, uh, that partially ad addresses a question from Yoti or Yoti. Um, do you have time for three, maybe three more questions? I can do a few more. Yeah, sure. Okay. So this one is about validity of data. So mm -hmm. it brings up the fact that survey data can be, they say subjective, but I'm thinking oftentimes mm -hmm. it's self-reported yeah. versus what you're saying, you know, peer reviewed empirical yeah. data. So how do you validate your research data? Right. So there's nothing wrong with survey data mm -hmm. in particular. Um, lots of peer reviewed data is from surveys. Um, validating data usually involves running experiments more than once, um, but there are ways of structuring a survey or, or a research experiment in a way that will um, avoid some of the pitfalls uh, that Geodi is uh, talking about, you know, in terms of subjectivity. So for example, you mentioned self-reporting. Well, you know, you can ask people um, and I mean, we've, we've seen this in, in some of the studies that we summarize. It's like, uh, you know, a large percentage of people who consider themselves vegetarian still consume meat once in a while. And so, um, there are ways of, um, verifying what people are saying. So for example, the reason that we know that is because in that study, uh, People were asked how they identify. So, for example, you know, vegan, vegetarian, oval, you know, all the different classifications of vegetarian, pescatarian, and and so on. Um, and then they were asked, well, how often do you consume meat in a month, or how often do you consume meat in a year, or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, um, you have to structure a survey in a way that will help to. Um, pick apart the different responses and to, you know, gauge the accuracy of what people are saying. Yeah, that's a great answer because, yeah, that first question is, um, as Jyoti said, subjective, but then you can def better define it with your mm -hmm. other questions. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. And then uh, we've got a um, question from Lida or Lida. Okay. Um, have you made any data analysis from the global south and how it differs from the global north in terms of veganism, mm -hmm. consumer behaviors, policies, et cetera? Yep. So uh, something that we are, you know, more specifically looking into with um, uh, and, and putting a concentration on with our original research is um, looking at non-Western countries. Um, and uh, specifically, we've uh, placed a, a fair amount of emphasis on what's what are called the BRIC nations, um, Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Um, those are big non-Western nations that are, uh, you know, 
uh, heavy consumers and producers of animal products. And so we've done a variety of research that, that looks at respondents from, uh, from those countries. And in our research library, we're also adding um, resources all the time that are not specific to uh, North America, let's say, or not specific to Europe. Um, something that we'll be doing uh, in the new year is unveiling a new uh, system of uh, tagging in our research library where you'll be able to look at all of the research, for example, from Asia or all the research from Africa or all the research from South America that we have in our library, and then also be able to explore by country. So if you're really interested in um, research from China, you'll be able to look at our China tag and see all of the research that we have on mm. uh, on animal issues from, from that country. Oh, that's really helpful. I hope that helps you. Um, I, I don't know how to pronounce the name correctly, if it's Lida, Lida or Lida, um, mm -hmm. you can let us know. But thank you for your great question. Thank you, everyone, for your great questions. Um, I realized I forgot to ask, some in our audience might want to make videos as part of their advocacy and um, you're you're an award-winning filmmaker um, who's produced this series and um, you might have some tips to offer advocates who are venturing into video making uh, yeah, I mean my first tip would be you know have have patience <laughs> it can be a hard uh, it can be a hard skill to uh, to pick up um, but I think you know people are very um, People are very well versed in videos now, um, more so than they were 10 or 15 years ago. You know, we consume a lot of video content all the time. And so I think people are generally cognizant of like what makes a good video and, and what sort of works in terms of pacing and things like that. Um, so I would say, you know, look into free uh, video editing software that exists. Um, look into, you know, uh, free stock footage sites that exist and, and um, you know, invest uh, a little bit of money into uh, a decent microphone <laughs> that you can use if you want to talk on your videos because uh, something that a, a filmmaker a friend of mine told me uh, when I was just starting to make films is they said, you know, people will generally forgive um, bad video but they will not forgive bad <laughs> audio if, if something is really hard to hear and mm. and you can't understand what someone is saying they will tune out immediately so um you know a, a hundred dollars for a, a decent mic is is money well spent that's really great advice thank you yeah a lot of us might not think about that but it's so true once you put yourself in the shoes of watching a video when it sounds bad you can't handle it so <laughs> yeah like if it's if it's like if there's weird background noise or if the quality of the recording is bad and it's distorted um i mean i personally would click away and within a few seconds um and i'm sure most people would as well so um a, you know there are a lot of different uh really good quality usb microphones on the market so if you want to get into video uh making and and you plan on doing your own voiceovers uh it's definitely a good investment thank you so much and and uh the the conversation has been wonderful thank you for being generous with your time um, everybody, if you miss part of this or you want to share this conversation with someone after the fact, yes, there, there will be a recording um, on our um, various channels on YouTube and um, other social media. Wonderful. Um, there is a question about, I think, specific cameras to use. I bet that would be a super long conversation. So maybe, Laura, you can sign up for an office hours. Yeah. With, <laughs> with yeah, you're, yeah, you're welcome to stop by uh, my office hours. Uh, my office hours are Tuesdays at noon, um, and I'm available for uh, an hour a week um, to, to talk with advocates about, you know, whatever their effective advocacy questions are. And, uh, yes, the... Uh, question about what camera to use huge huge conversation but i will say um you know this 
these these cameras right here are uh pretty darn good <laughs> yeah. i will say uh you know i i recently picked up uh, a new phone and it is the video quality is uh, just as good as or like <laughs> i don't want to say better but it's 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 pretty darn good compared to an actual video camera so um you know there are uh you know if you already have a phone that takes pretty decent video um there are actually a range of different um consumer uh attachments that you can attach onto your phone that um give you uh better audio you know you can attach microphones to it or there are different sort of like steady cams or tripods that you can use to stabilize it um so you know most people already have a video camera uh, in their pocket. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, learning how to use it, seeing uh, and, you know, seeing the best quality you can get out of it. Yeah, I heard a photographer say the best camera is the one you have with you in the yep. moment you need to take that picture. So yep. <laughs> that's the phone. Um, there you go. And and yeah, as a, a kind of amateur music producer i i saw a video on how the the new phone also has jumped up in their audio quality the absolutely. microphone quality yeah yep absolutely well thank you everyone for making this conversation so interesting with your great questions and comments and thank you again carl and uh, let me invite patrick back on to to sign us all off thank you for hosting patrick yeah, of course. And, and Carl, thank, th Carl, sorry. Thank you so much. This has been a tremendous presentation. I'm so glad that that you made your time available for all our activists, our grantees. Um, really appreciative of everything that you do and everything the Phonalytics does. My pleasure. And uh, thank you so much to VegFund for uh, for helping support our video work. It's been um, you know, it, it has been a program that we've wanted to get off the ground for a while and your support, support has been really crucial mm. to, to helping us do that. So thank you. Mm. Thank you. That's great to hear. And yeah. just one last thing too, is, um, I just, uh, added uh, a little survey and if everybody, oh, if you, if you, if y'all wouldn't mind just kind of checking that out, it's real quick, just, uh, give your feedback for this presentation. It'll help us in the future, you know, you know, uh, know what you want to keep learn about, maybe do a little bit better in some areas, who knows? Um, yeah, just submit your feedback there. It'd be, we really appreciate it. Um, and I just also want to mention that we would love to feature grantees on these live socials as well. So um, if you have an idea or, or expertise, just reach out to me. Uh, reach out to me on like, any one of the platforms, uh, and uh, Facebook, Instagram, wherever you want. And awesome. let me know, yeah. And uh, okay, well, I think that's everything. So Carl, thanks so much again. Estella, thank you. And thank you everybody who attended. We really, we really uh, loved having you here. Yeah, and thanks to you both. And I uh, thank you for your work that you're doing on behalf of animals. And thank you. Yeah. Bye everyone.